Hi, everybody. Welcome to this special edition Earth Science Week public lecture with the Geological Society and our very special guest, Harry Young of Viral Rock Map Sensation. Um, each October, the Geological Society coordinates Earth Science Week in the UK in cooperation with the American Geoscience Institute. The Earth Science Week programme promotes um, responsible stewardship of the Earth through celebratory events and opportunities to discover Earth science or geology. Um, this year's theme emphasises the influence geoscience has in our homes and in our daily lives. We hope that it will encourage people to appreciate how geoscience relates to their interests, their communities and their lives. And as a society, we celebrate by hosting a variety of different events for all ages and backgrounds throughout the week. So far, we've hosted a film screening exploring the links between geology and Lord of the Rings, a programme of grant funding to support outreach events all over the UK, from planetarium shows to local walks. And we're very much looking forward to our completely sold out family screening of the popular film Ice Age this Saturday, where people will learn all about how ice cores at, um, can tell you about Earth's history. Earth Science Week doesn't just look to educate, it hopes to inspire a lifelong passion for Earth Science and instill a deep sense of stewardship for our planet. So to, um, to mark this, we are absolutely delighted today to be joined by Harry Young, the creator of this amazing geological map of Scotland that you can see on screen, which is composed entirely of rocks collected throughout his lifetime. Having been inspired to make this map in 1992, this incredible piece of geo art was over 30 years in the making. Harry's grandson, rightfully having noticed that the map was something pretty special, posted about the map on Twitter, at which point it went viral online, and since February has been viewed more than 6.2 million times. Since the map has been put on display in the society earlier this year, we think it's been seen by thousands of visitors, from geoscientists to tourists, with many people making special trips just to see the map in real life. We are incredibly grateful to have had the map on display in the Geological Society's library over the past few months, um, taking centre stage for visitors throughout the summer. And we're very grateful to Harry for agreeing to come and chat to us all about the map and about his passion for geology. Um, and even more so, what it feels like to become geology's hottest online topic. So Harry, welcome and over to you. Thank you, Megan, for that uh, lovely introduction. And, uh, and hello to everyone, wherever you are and whoever you are, because I can't see anyone. I can only see a couple of people. So it looks as though it's uh, like an Edinburgh thing fringe event where nobody sold any tickets. But um, if I uh, can start with my pre-viral map, uh, I, as Megan said, I started the map in uh, 20, 20 uh, sorry, 1992 and finished it in 2020. Uh, but of course, it wasn't it wasn't uh, something I was doing all the time. It was just an as and when, because we had an old house at Tinnabrew and we were doing it up. So uh, it was just done bit by bit. And I'll go into the actual logistics of doing the map a bit later. But there was a wee lad across the road when we lived in Lanarkshire called Elliot, and he was about 10, and he said, Harry, see this map you're doing? What if you die before you finish it? And I said, Elliot, that is highly likely the way things are going. So I started the, this map, as I say, and then when the pandemic came and we had lockdown, that allowed me to sort of finish it off and uh, do the touches like uh, painting around the, the edges and uh, putting on a cartouche, which I'll talk about later. So uh, that's uh, that's what happened. And it lay in love for something like three years out in my conservatory. But my, my daughter, Marita, and my son, Richard, they thought for my 85th uh, birthday, which was this year in February, they thought they would have it framed. And of course, they had to have a wee unveiling ceremony in my front hall. 
and the field map was. Uh, my grandson saw the photographs and the videos that were taken at the time, and he lives in West Sussex, and uh, he's called Harry too. Harry Jeffrey said, Grandpa, can I put this out on Twitter? And I said, Harry, no, only if it goes viral. Oh, he said, I think we can make it go viral, Grandpa. And so that's what happened. He, he got the he got the enough of the the sub story bit in this old geezer who's made the map and he wanted to go viral. And it took him twenty eight years, and that was enough for people to pass it on. And and so I think I, yeah, I think it's six point two million or something actually saw it. And of course, it attracted. Uh, the great and the good too, because the Geological Society asked if they could borrow it, which, as you know, that's where it is now. And uh, you can see me in my front wall there in the, in the slides that Megan has put up. And uh, that was that's what came out on the the Twitter, and uh, or what I believe it's called the X now. So. Uh, that was that was pre-viral. Post-viral, oh, I, I I don't know how many press associations came on to me and uh, asking question after question, but mostly they were the same questions. So uh, I think maybe I'll be able to cover most of the questions that people have uh, just by going over the ones that were asked in these press releases. During all that time with radio, and uh, I was on Radio 5 Live, and I was on the Scottish News, but uh, during that time, nobody asked me what I called them up, and my name for it was Scotch on the Rocks, but uh, no one has picked that one up. So, of course, in the the news program on TV that it, it, it's always at the end of the news these quirky items come up and uh, I said to the presenters there, this is a bit I call Mutter's Corner what do you call it? And they said oh we call it and finally so uh, I'm not quite to and finally yet but hopefully we'll get there Excuse me if I have a little sip from my... Do you like my mug? That's better. So, one of the, one of the bad things about going on social media, of course, you get these trolls. And this person said, this is fake news, this map. There's a, Scotland's not independent yet. Where, where's England? This shouldn't be allowed. So unknown to them, if you look at the very bottom right-hand corner of the map, you'll see there's a line of white stones, then red, and then white again. That, if you look closely, is below the border and is actually an elongated map, or flag rather, of uh, England. So that person was wrong. I did have England in the map after all. So last lap to me. So one of the questions was, why? Why did you think to do this map? Well, after, after it had gone viral, uh, two geologists told me that they had both thought of doing it but had never ever got round to doing it. So that at least made me think it wasn't just the way my twisted brain was working, that other people had thought of it but just had never done it. But uh, another thing that I thought, perhaps uh, I do have a love of maps and the first maps I used was when I left school at 16 and uh, you couldn't run away to sea at that time, but you had to do three months at Technical College, first of all. But I, w I went away to sea as an apprentice, say, navigating officer, 
and uh, reached the dizzy heights of second mate in the merchant navy. And of course, our maps were admiralty charts, and uh, for everywhere in the world, of course, because you never know on a ship where you're going next. And uh, these charts, when you take them out, more information about the sea than the land, of course. But if you step out on the wing of the bridge, then you can look at reality and you can see the coast, you can see the sea, you can see the lighthouse. So maybe it was this thought that, okay, I'm looking at a representation on a chart. I want to see reality. And maybe that's what I wanted to see Scotland or Scotch on the rocks and, and see where these rocks are in the country. So maybe that's a crazy theory. I don't know, but uh, it helps fill in a couple of minutes. Anyway, <laughs> doesn't it? There you go. So I did get inspired by someone uh, to take up the hobby of geology. This person was when I was working with the Clyde River Purification Board. Now, how stayed is that title? I mean, if we were in America, it would be the Anti-Pollution Task Force or something similar. But uh, it was the Clyde River Purification Board. And uh, this person that inspired me was a hydrogeologist. I was in the hydrology department, and the name is Tricia Hinton. Well, I didn't know until recently how involved with your geological society Tricia is. In fact, she actually ran for president at one time, uh, and uh, unfortunately was unsuccessful because she she was a very enterprising young woman when I knew her, and uh, she eventually, when all the river boats came together. Uh, along with waste disposal and uh, nuclear uh, inspectorate, this was called the Scottish Environment Protection Agency. In England, it's the Environment Agency. And eventually, Tricia was to become CEO of this agency. And I, I by this time, she was my boss by this time, and uh, I was in staff health and safety at that time. So I, I was writing uh, procedures for all these new staff. And uh, so I worked with Tricia on that. So she inspired me because, and she also, had, she'd just been a, a road trip around America. I think she was jumping on and off Greyhound buses, if I recollect. And she, she gave me a couple of fossils and of course, I thought, this is so interesting. I mean, I like kicking stones along the beach anyway, but to have these fossils uh, really sort of interested me. And that then led to going to some classes at Les Mahigo School. We lived in Lanarkshire. And at that time, Glasgow University had the... Uh, an extra mural studies, and and they would send an expert out and do maybe ten lectures, uh, very cheap uh, it was too. I, I don't know. I, th I think they paid ten shillings or something at that time. And we we had the pleasure of uh, Dr. Ian Rolfe down to Les Mahigo. Uh, Les Mahigo is quite near this Silurian inlet, and uh, at one time, I think it was in the 30s, they had a Camp Siluria there where people would come from all over and they uh, spend the port night holiday digging up rocks. So uh, Ian came down and he took us through some lectures and uh, then we were out in the field too, of course, and uh, looking for these, we were up to her knees and Eurypterids and Slimonia. And so Ian was a uh, very knowledgeable. Uh, he was curator of the the Hunterian Museum, I believe, at that time. And uh, so that started off. And uh, so I then, because he was he was 
probably telling us all, join the Geological Society of Glasgow. And this is what I did. And uh, of course, they had monthly lectures. And uh, the summertime, we had outings too. And of course, you take a packed lunch, and you're tramping over the Ojo Hills or up the campuses or something. And of course, you're talking to like-minded people on a Saturday, out all day, hammering lumps out the countryside and going home with a rucksack full of funny coloured rocks. And uh, so that was one part of my education. And then Jim McDonald was part of this extramural scheme and he had a three-year certificate course going at Glasgow University. And I think it was called Geology and the Environment, which suited me down to ground with the, the, the riverboard thing. And the, by the way, the riverboard, uh, everybody asked us, when are the salmon coming back to Clyde? And they say, oh, yes, we're, we're trying to take our best. Yeah, we'll get... But believe it or not, after 150 years of no salmon up the river, we got the salmon back. And they, they were running up. In fact, the first guy to be arrested for poaching used a crossbow. And there's two policemen standing there as he fired at the salmon jumping out of the water. How daft is that? So, <laughs> anyway, the... The Clyde River Board, I thought this might be useful as part of my CV to do this Georgian environment. And it was a three year course. That meant we did the essays and we had examinations. And they even at the end, we had an external examiner too. So it was all above board. And the good thing about this course, over the three years, we had some. Uh, Lovely outings with Jim McDonald too. I think there was about eight of us in the class. So we, we got to know each other pretty well and uh, whose round it was in the pub sort of thing. So uh, Jim McDonald, he would take us to these places. And one of them was, if, if I tell you the Sunday morning, we went along to Sicker Point. Those of you who know about James Hutton will know what I'm going to talk about next. And this was where Hutton, well, not, I believe it's only just one of his unconformities, but uh, this is his one at Sicker Point. And he came by sea. We went across a field full of cows and uh, <laughs> waded through the air droppings and got to the sea. So Jim, Sunday morning, takes out this old batter boot. He's standing on the rock, and it just looked like he was going to give his sermon on the mount with this old book that he pulled out. And I think it was written by John Playfair, but Playfair uh, who, who did lots of accounts of Hutton's revelations. And, uh, of course, he, uh, Playfair, would be astounded at the things that uh, Hutton was going to say, because you remember this was in 17, 1788. And of course, people at that time still thought that the world started or the earth started about 4,000 years ago. This was somebody, of course, saying, oh, Jacob begat Abraham and Abraham begat. There was a lot of begatting went on. And they worked it backwards and thought, yeah, the Earth's about four and a half thousand years old. But of course, Hutton demolished that one and said, no, this Devonian old red sandstone sitting on top of the Silurian, there's, there's been such a time gap there because this is there's been a transformation of the Silurian and there's aging and this weathering and and he then realized this is we're talking millions and millions of years and boy a new concept and and playfair sums it up uh, uh jimmy donald uh, spoke quite a bit of playfair's 
account. But I'll just read this uh, small one. The mind seemed to grow giddy by looking so far back into the abyss of time. That, that would be that would be quite a thing for play here, probably. Uh, and, and it made me think too that this, this, what a brain that guy Hunt must have had to work all this out. As Jim was talking or giving his sermon, uh, and, and funnily enough, I found out later, John Playfair was a minister, I presume, of the Church of Scotland. So uh, there, was, there was Jim reading us, and we were joined by two American geologists. And uh, they were so entranced by all that was going on. And they were looking at different sites in the area too. And so they asked, could they just come with us for the day? And uh, of course, Jim with his... Highland hospitality said yes, of course. So they came with us all day. In fact, they came in the pub and had lunch with us too. They may have, they may have bought us a drink, I don't know. But they hopefully they went back to America and said, That's okay, Scotland. He's oh, they give sermons out in this in Hutton's unconformity. So <laughs> that that was just that was just one of the outings. Uh, another one was he knew we liked a good hike. We all had our, our hiking boots on every time we went out with Jim. And he took us to the eastern side of Loch Lomond. And uh, we climbed Conic Hill. Uh, is it near Rowerden, Richard? Yeah. Yeah, near Rowerden. And uh, we climbed Conic Hill. And we got to the summit. It's not a hard climb, really. When we got up there, uh, we're looking down upon the loch. And we could see these islands going across. All the islands in Loch Lomond are, are inch something. I don't know if that comes from the Latin insula or, or whether it's Gaelic. But anyway, they're inch kailioch and inch modern. And so there's a line of islands across the loch sort of diagonally. And Jim then told us that is the line of the Highland Boundary Fault. So that was pretty impressive to see that, to, to be able to look upon the actual line of the boundary fault. Another one he took us to when we were up at Fort William was uh, Glen Roy. And the parallel roads of Glen Roy are definitely worth a visit if, uh, if you're into glaciation, because at one time they thought they were roads that drovers had made these for bring cattle over or something, but then when the the glaciologists, if that's a, a career, I don't know, they they said this was different shorelines and uh, as the ice uh, melted or it jammed at the far end of the glen and then the water stayed as a loch for a while, then it would melt or unjam or whatever and uh, then the level would go down again and so there's three distinct roads at different levels within uh, Glen Roy. So um, that was all of these outings, of course, and all of the the ones at uh, the Geological Society of Glasgow, I was picking up samples all the time. I was very careful to actually identify where I had found those, and they were all carefully marked for location, which served me well when I was putting them together. So, uh, of course, I, I, another one I did was uh, a, a summer school in Aberdeen, and that was uh, run by uh, a fellow called Con Gillen, who's, uh, I, I think he might now be at Edinburgh University, I'm not sure, but Con was uh, an expert on metamorphic rocks. Uh, but he took us around all these sites in Aberdeen and round the coast and uh, we had a week there. Now that that's that's where I met this woman called uh, Anita Kenyon. She later married Alex Smith, who I believe was 
Professor Alex Smith, of, uh, I think it was University of London, geologist. In fact, I believe Alex was the founder of that, your magazine, Geology Today. And uh, so she was Danish and could speak German and a party of Germans came to the halls of residence we were in and said uh, what they were studying and asked Anita, and what are you all studying this week? And she said, oh, we're, we're studying uh, geology. And the Germans said, ah, I see you brought your own fossils. Well, that was a bit rude, wasn't it? I know some of our lady members had uh, walking sticks and hip replacements and stuff, but that was a bit off, I felt. So <laughs> that, was, that was a week of more collecting and tabulating where we'd been in the uh, Port Soy, uh, the lovely marble there, and various places all around the coast. So that filled in another big area for me on the map. Um, if I could now go on to the actual logistics of making the map, I just took the, the actual geology. Oh, yes, good slide, Megan. Uh, I've, I've got here in front of me the, the actual map I used, and it's, uh, the, it says on it, uh, the Institute of Geolo Geological Sciences, and then underneath, now called BGS, the British Geological Survey. Well, that was 1979, so I guess that was the transition, the changeover from the Institute of Geological Sciences. It cost me all of three pounds. And so I just went out and bought a piece of marine ply, the same size as this map, which I think was three feet by two feet. And uh, but then I had to get an outline of Scotland onto this to match the actual map because I wanted it to be the same. And as I said in my Twitter thing, I wanted it to be accurate if I could. And I also wanted it to be aesthetically pleasing as a, as a piece of art. I like that word, the uh, geo art that Megan used. That was, uh, I like that. So that's the, the the map that I used. And has anyone heard of carbon paper? I mean, it's, I know I know my children don't and they're in their fifties, but carbon paper was what typists used to use to put between two sheets of paper, put in the typewriter and clatter away. And this gave them a, a copy. Uh, so this is what I did. I stuck on pieces of carbon paper and uh, put my own mark on top, probably with masking tape, and, and sort of drew around the whole outline of Scotland with all the sea lochs and all the islands. And But uh, when, I, when I took off the map and uh, the actual... The actual... Uh, <laughs> Somebody put a comment about carbon paper. <laughs> uh, when I took off the the map, I felt that it wasn't heavy enough, so I went over the whole thing with uh, Indian ink, and so that that was a bit more permanent and uh, just as well when it took twenty eight years, you see. But as you can see, I started at the border. And I walked my way up to the Southern Uplands Fault. That these fault lines were very handy, just to to, to be like uh, different targets for me as I moved up the map. And uh, of course, living in the south uh, of uh, Scotland at that time, I, I went down to uh, the Greymere's Tail, which is a um, waterfall near Moffat, in the uh, down there near the borders, and I was looking for graptolites. I took with me a little collie dog that came with me most days out to the rivers that I was uh, measuring, and, and this collie dog, well, my, my children took it out in their paper runs as well, and so this dog came from my cousin's farm, 
and uh, we it was given the name Melan. Yes, melancholy. I know it's too much, isn't it? But it was never sad. It was a lovely dog, and we had it for 15 years, and it, so it would come out with me for the whole day, paddling in rivers or, or whatever, or just lying at my feet or whatever I was doing. So down there, got all these graptolites, and they're fascinating, aren't they, graptolites? And they're extinct, of course, but... It, I believe it comes from the grapto to, to write because it just looks like as if somebody's written on slate, but they're like little uh, frets or blades. And I believe that those who are into that era can actually date the, the, the rock by the evolution of the graptolites uh, over the millions of years. So that was, that was where I started the the map down there and uh, of course just slowly working my way up and or as I or I would research some of the places and go out myself or I had I had some perhaps from uh, from some these wee messages are flashing up my screen here very distracting. So uh, I I Worked my way up, and uh, the very end of the map, the last place I had to go was the Western Isles. And uh, I I went with one of those uh, bus trips. David Burkert was a company that travelled around Scotland. And, uh, of course, you went on the bus, and everybody on the bus had white hair. And uh, so I went up to... Uh, all pulling across in the ferry with them, and we stayed uh, for a long weekend in the uh, Harris and Lewis, and uh, of course it was to it was to see things like the the standing stones at Kalanish and things. I gave I gave them a big hug as well because they said it will give you good. The bus driver told me bring you good luck and and, and long life, and uh, well, so far it's worked, and uh, so. I told the others on the bus because you you get in the bar together and things. You get quite friendly on these kind of bus trips, and uh, I told them that we were looking for the uh, rocks that look like licorice all sorts. So there they were all bringing me back these little samples uh, and that look like licorice all sorts, black white stripes on them. And uh, this is Lewis and nice too. So I would always say to them, "Well, that's a nice rock, yes." And so. Uh, that was a bit of fun. That was the last place I had to fill in for the map. And got them home. What happened next? Pandemic. And then into lockdown. And so I was able to finish it. Uh, and no contact with little Elliot by that time. I wish I could have told him, it's all done, Elliot. I made it. <laughs> but uh, he, uh, he would have been pleased, I suppose, since he'd seen it at uh, half stages there, uh, as you can see in the in the slide that uh, Megan has put up. But um, so, where are we now? Yes, uh, I did want to say, if you're at all interested in in geology, and and you're not living in Scotland. Uh, because I don't know where you are if you're signed into this talk. But it's a fantastic place to find out more about the rocks because we've got fault lines, we've got rift valleys, we've got thrusts, and we've got subduction zones. <laughs> and I think for such a small area, there's such a wealth of rocks and minerals. And, and of course, because the landforms are made up from such events in geology, we've also got this stunning scenery and sea lochs all around the west coast. And uh, it, and of course, it's uh, the local seafood and the uh, Aberdeen Angus beef. So the food and the 
international drink, of course. I don't mean I am brew, I mean whiskey beha, and that's there's various whiskies you can sample and go to distilleries and have a tour. So Scotland is a great place if you're interested in geology. So I've I know that one of the questions when uh, I started or when I finished this map was why is there no Orkney in Shet no Shetland? Now I could I could dodge that bullet hopefully by saying, well, if you look at McCulloch's map, there's no Orkney and no Shetland there. But uh, I, I believe Shetland hates to be put in as a, an inset, as it is on the 10-mile map that I used. In fact, I, I, somebody told me that uh, you can buy a map in, in Shetland and it's Shetland, and inset is the rest of the United Kingdom. That'd be good, wouldn't it? But uh, I, <laughs> that that wasn't my prime reason for not including Orkney in Shetland. The, the prime reason is 700 years ago, I believe it was, and I can't, I can't condone that one person should have such power that he can actually give away islands and people from his country to another country. Now, this is the king of Norway I'm talking about, and he was so skinned when his daughter was about to marry the king of Scotland that he had no dowry. So he gave the king of Scotland Orkney and Shetland. And I just find that deplorable. And I, I, I believe them now is there a movement in Shetland to, I, I, even through council meetings, that some people would like to go back and rejoin Norway. Because if you look at the map, eh, I, I believe Shetland's nearer to Oslo than it is to London. And so that, there's that to it. I'm looking at the map now that uh, Megan has put up while well, it's in the library, and I haven't mentioned that uh, the cartouche. Uh, that's, I, I felt it needed a wee bit of balance down there on the left-hand side. And the cartouche, this is my sort of nod to ancient mariners, shall we say. Fellows who made the sea charts originally, they would they would put a cartouche and it would be highly decorative and it would always say on it uh, the date and the person who made the map. And in my case, it's got 2020 and the uh, Harry Young fake it. And that, that's just Latin for, yeah. I hope you can't hear that. <laughs> no, it's, that's it off. Sorry about that. Somebody's phoning. Anyway, the, the cartouche, it says, Harry Young fake it. That's just Latin for Harry Young made it. It's not a sweary word. And But somebody told me that the actual uh, fossil that it's sitting on is a member of the, the sea urchin family. And, and round that, of course, I've just got little shells. So I felt it just balanced up the thing, and it was mine. It was mine, not to the ancient chap makers too. So I think we've kind of reached a uh, and finally here. And I would, I would just like to thank both Megan and Katie in in Burlington House for looking after my map so well. You know that a. Uh, as I said to Katie, she told me she would have sold it by this time, but she hasn't done that. And, and of course, Megan, every day she comes out, inspects the map, and if any wee rocks have fallen off, she's got a tube of glue and she sticks them back on again. She She's a qualified geologist, so I do allow that. So anyway, I think I'm saying and finally, and I hope I haven't dragged on too long, and I'll hand you back to Megan.
Harry, thank you so very much. This has been the most entertaining public lecture I have attended in a very long while. It's been brilliant to hear the history of your absolute adoration and love for Scotland's geology, but also about all of the different people that you met throughout creating the map and all of their stories and how they intertwine into this incredible piece of, it is GeoArt, I guess, uh, that we've been so fortunate to have on display in the Geological Society. Um, I haven't actually had to glue anything back onto it. I promise it's been completely intact the whole time. <laughs> but I did want to say just before we go that um, the legacy of the map has is, is not just its time at the Geological Society. And for people who want to know more about the rock map um, or who maybe have kids who might be interested in the rock map, Harry has written a brilliant article about uh, pebble hunting for the Rockwatch magazine, which you can find online or if you're nearby us, you can pick up a copy. Um, he's front page news for Rockwatch and uh, that's been really popular for people who've come to visit the map in Burlington House and further afield. Can, can I speak again, Megan? Please, uh, please That please. magazine, I wrote the articles and in the back page. So I, not only did I get cover girl at the front and I got the back page, but I was centerfold as well. So there you are. It, that's, it, was, it was a pleasure to do. And I hope it, it does inspire some young people, maybe. Let's say uh, there's a, a, a young girl in New Zealand wants to do the North Island now. And, they, and perhaps somebody in Canada wants to do their province and build up the rock where they live. And that would be wonderful to find out that people were doing their own location and making their own rock map. Sorry for that interruption. No, not at all. I think that's exactly what we hope to. And in the same vein, um, we recently hosted Open House at the Geological Society, where over a thousand people came to visit the building and see the map. Um, and as part of that, our education team created this kind of version of a Harry's map, if you like, that you can now see on screen. Um, so throughout the day, children that visited would pick up a little piece of paper or scrap material and contribute to this overall picture of, of the geology of Scotland that we now have proudly hanging in our office. And we've got a schools uh, pack and classroom activity also being developed um, which is what your lovely portrait was drawn for, Harry, which we're hoping will encourage people to kind of look at the geology in their area and think about how they can creatively represent it. So we're very much hoping for people to be inspired by your map too, to do the same where they live. All that that is, uh, all, all that's left to say really is thank you so much to everybody who's tuned in to be with us online. Um, everybody has kind of join this to hear more about the map and if you would like to find out any more about the map or Harry you can contact us through our website um, and we'd be more than happy to put you in touch. It's been an absolute pleasure to be able to host the map and to, to meet you Harry and I'm really delighted to be able to share your story with everybody who's super interested in it. Thank you.